Hey, this is Tom Holkenborg. Many people might also know me as Junkie XL. Right now, I am a Hollywood movie composer and still a music lover and also a big nerd when it comes to sounds, especially musical ones. In these next several episodes of this video magazine, I'm going to show you how and why I am creating this sample library. Hey guys, you absolutely sound fantastic. So that anybody can create an even better film score, a piece of music, or simply just having fun playing with it. Are you ready? Let's do it. Finally, as if the day would never come, we were there and we were now gonna record our first sounds. There's no way. I can do a library on my own. You need a fantastic set of players. You need people that know how to build an architecture into a plugin. You need people that are experts how to deal with file management. You need people that are experts at what does the, the user interface look like and how does this work, how does that work. You need to know a lot about how computers work. Um, how does the processing work when you load up a plugin? How is it? accessing the samples fast enough. You need to know a lot about sounds. You need to know a lot about articulations and how the musicians play. Uh, you need um, a conductor that knows how to motivate the players. You, it, it's such a big environment to build a sampling library like this. And, you know, there's like 15 or 20 people on the building organization side that go in left alone you know, the, the 40 to 50 players that you need to, to play everything. And then the engineering and then the technicians, you know, to get all the right microphones. And it's a really big uh, setup and it's a pretty big endeavor to do, but boy, is it great when it's finally done and you play it and it's like, man, this is what I always wanted. I think to record the, the, the library at the Teldex studio was the smartest thing to do. Not only did I actually record scores here in the past, uh, so I already had a relationship with the sound engineer, Tom. I had a relationship with some of the players uh, here. And I am an owner of uh, Orchestral Tools uh, libraries dating back as, as far as the, the first library that came out, which was called like uh, String Runs or Fast Runs or something like that, like almost like nine years ago. So it made the most sense. It's a, it's, it's a company that's based uh, in Berlin. The studio is in Berlin. Uh, so it, it made the most sense to, to, to do it here. And hey, any excuse that I can take to go back to Europe for a week or two weeks or three weeks, I'll take it. So this was one of them. Since there's only 12 of you, I can actually shake your hand. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Up to this point, I've always used commercial libraries uh, um, with uh, brass out there uh, to make the demos. And obviously, I always go in and record it with, uh, with a, a real orchestra. Now, the problem is, a lot of these libraries out there will not give you that energy that live, live bra brass players really give you. Before I go in and record with the real orchestra, I have to convince the, co the director of the film that I know what I'm doing. And I have to pull so many tools out of my pocket to make that work with the libraries out there. So if I convince the director that I know what I'm doing, uh, I can then go in and record this with, uh, with live players. I know this is uh, sometimes a painful process to, to, uh, to get this done, but my respect for you as players is in high regards. And without guys like you, I wouldn't have a job. How much do you practice um, a day? Well, ideally, that would be uh, two hours in the morning and yeah. another one and a half in the evening. This is yeah, so that's what many people don't get, you know, just like how much these guys need to practice to, yeah, keep, well, to, keep you, to, to stay at your yeah, game. Ideally, it's never a day off. That's yeah. the thing, yeah. I mean, of course, you take a break, a season, well, the season has a break. Uh, we take a few weeks off in summer, but even then, back, going back into... into it's pretty into hard, this, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It takes as much time as I, as I paused yeah. to get where I was before, yeah. if not longer. But uh, some, some people are easier with that. But uh, I found out you have a pretty colorful background. You were actually born in the US, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm a Rhode, Rhode Islander. A Rhode Islander. Originally, yeah, but uh, grew up in Pennsylvania and Ohio. I started playing when I was six years old in Pennsylvania. And I was an army officer in the United States Army and uh, was stationed here for three years. Oh, yeah, because there's a... A yeah. bunch of army bases here in the U.S. And that's right. And I was, uh, you know, at the time the wall was up and it yeah. was Cold War. And it was, I think, my first night in Berlin, there was an alarm. And within three hours, an entire brigade was ready for war. 
in wow. three hours. It was crazy. Yeah, it was nuts. And then I, the next day, I went to meet my platoon at Spandau Prison, guarding Rudolf Hess. So it's really, you know, this old remnants of the Cold War and wow. World War II really pulled me in here. And uh, I was here when the wall fell down and just fell in love with the city. And, and that's when I picked up my horn again. And You know, as a composer, sometimes you look at a, at a, a group of people, right? Like whether it's like 68 string players or uh, 32 brass players. And you look at them as a group, you know? Uh, but sometimes you forget the individual stories that goes all behind these players yeah. and the... Uh, hard study and, you know, getting to the level where e each of you are. And um, yeah, right. like I said earlier, you know, like, you guys make my life easy to become a composer, you know, because I, I, I come up with these things and put them on paper and yeah. you guys make it make a reality, make it make it alive. I think what we achieved at the, uh, here in the Teldex studio with the recording is, uh, it, at this point, is a very high level of production and it goes back and forth with um, people that I work with around the world. Uh, to uh, advise the whole team, including myself, was like, what microphone should we use? And from what year? And where do we put them? And what are we going to do with the players? Um, which players do we pick? And where do we put them in, in, in the room? And how do we move the setup around? So a lot of thought has to go into that. And also a little bit of experimentation. You know, we did test recordings. It's like, okay, well, how would the horn sound like if they sit over here? How it would sound like if, it, if they sit over there? And... Um, it takes like some experimentation. I think that's also one of the things that I potentially don't like about some of the existing libraries out there. It's like, well, if you just throw a bunch of horn guys into a room and you record them, you're done. But I mean, that's not really how it works. And if you record a film score, that's also not how it works. You go really meticulously over each detail uh, in the composing process, but also later um, when you're recording, conducting, orchestration, mixing, um, making sure that it sounds great at a dubbing stage. At every step, you constantly need to push yourself to the max to make sure that you get what you need and something that serves the picture. And that's primarily why I made this um, brass library with uh, orchestral tools, that I felt the libraries that I had were not servicing the picture as well as they could. Yes, when I get the green light, I will go into the studio and record everything live with all these uh, musicians. But in order to convince the, the, the director or the studio that you have the right music for the movie, you need a library that can deliver that. And that's why I built this library. The moment is finally there. We're now in the control room. We were before in the recording room, but now we are in the control room. And the moment is there, we're almost about to start recording. Um, the trumpet players are out there. Uh, they're warming up a little bit, so we might hear a little bit of trumpet sounds here and there. Uh, but this is the control room. Um, this is where we hear everything, what's being played. This is where we judge whether the performance was good. Uh, and this is where we discuss whether we move forward or we move back. Uh, so let's make a little round here. Um, Sasha and Hendrik um, are actually constantly checking um, what's being played and they're the main uh, producers of what's being played. I'm sitting over there and I'm keeping an eye on and an ear on everything that's going on and I might have some extra notes, but these guys are experts, they make sure everything sounds great. They're also looking over the score, what needs to be played. Um, so we have um, uh, some notes written down, how, how they should perform it and we record it like that. And then right next to it, we have Tom that we have met right. before. Tom is the engineer, make sure that everything gets recorded perfectly. And right next to him, we have Connie who listens on a headset constantly if there's a noise in the room or something else is going on that's not quite right and we have to redo the take. Um, now, a little bit about this control room. This control room is filled with amazing gear, really old compressors, old amplifiers, whatever, you name it. But actually we're not really using that because we're using really nice microphones that we already talked about, the Neumann microphones. And we actually recording straight into Pro Tools, um, all like individual tracks. And then later uh, in my studio in Los Angeles, um, I'm gonna mix all these recordings and then it's gonna go back to Germany it's a lot of going back and forth. And then everything is going to be packed up into this library and it's all going to be fantastic and great. So that's the control room.
Hey guys, you absolutely sound fantastic as a group. Thank you so much. All of this recording was pretty complicated, I have to say, but I think I figured it out. It's more the tone than it actually is the volume, yeah, if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. It's just like a brassier tone. Yeah, that's <clears throat> what I told them now. Because if you layer these guys up with like the bass drum bones, like an octave lower with yeah. basso and, and the tuba, it needs, uh, yeah, 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 really needs really to be that. That was actually very good. That was actually very nice. Can we have another copy, please? I don't think it needs to be pack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just with a with a decrescendo at the end. Yeah. You know? And then the staccato is like ta, and then the staccatissimo is like ta. Yeah. Cool. You know, really like so you can do, you can do like down. It doesn't matter what length you pick. As long as they're consistent throughout the keyboards on yeah. all the notes, because that's the most annoying thing yeah. when you play a low note and then and then high as a pow, yeah. pow. You know, it's a very precise process and complicated too, because we had to constantly transfer files between Los Angeles and Berlin. Everything had to be in order. Tom, is uh, is somebody is somebody in check on, on the files on the downloads? Alan is saying that files are missing. Okay. Yeah, I, he, he should have the, the very first take already. Yeah, and the rest. He's saying is, he's missing files. Um, he will email the his assistant will now email the. Oh, here we go. We're missing audio files. Tumbo and twelve ten. Yeah, yeah, because this is still everything, everything. Yeah, because this is still uploading. That was good. Yeah, a little bit too long, maybe. Yeah, but, yeah, but on this performance, but yeah, but the performance keep, was keep, right. Keep, uh, keep in mind, though, it's like, for instance, there was no brass library mm -hmm. I was able to program this with. If we can have like a little break with these, it's like ten seconds. Um, I'm talking about the two, the three different articulations here. Here they come, like. Like I, uh, yeah, but I mean it's a combination of a staccato, marcato, and mm -hmm. then with the legato simple like behind it. There was not one brass library that would give me this. It, it was it, it it drove us insane. After a long day of recording, mind you, we did triples a day. And what does it mean triple a day? It means you're doing three sessions of three hours a day, from ten to one, two to five, and from six to nine. And we finally called it a day. I was talking yesterday with uh, David, like yeah. on the sides when you guys were yeah. long gone, and he said it's, it's he he was just saying it's too intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is to play like an hour and a half fortissimo. It's like because he was he. He was saying, like, see you tomorrow. I hope that my lips have recovered. <laughs> that, that's what he said when he left. Yeah. One day down, 29 more days to go. Ooh. What made me a little bit nervous uh, in the beginning was um, just basically the amount of uh, material that we've recorded. I have an idea uh, how complex this can be, but I had no idea that it would be this complex. 